This is Timeless Leadership, where we explore what makes extraordinary people tick. We look for the universal truths that will help make us better versions of ourselves. Hello, it's Scott Monty. Welcome back to Timeless Leadership. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with one of the best-known names in podcasting, Kara Swisher. Her name inspires admiration from some and fear in others. But to everyone, she's on her A-game when it comes to technology. And our conversation ranges from AI to authenticity, accountability in leadership, parenting styles, poetry, and yes, Taylor Swift. Kara shares tips and lessons for anyone who's progressing through the world today, regardless of your industry, and gives us a preview of her forthcoming memoir. If you're ready, join me and Kara Swisher for this journey into timeless leadership. She calls herself the old lady of tech. Others have called her a vitriolic and shrill media lady, but her opinions are timely and heard by millions. Whatever you call Kara Swisher, she's still at the center of it all. She's been on the cutting edge of journalism, tech, and media since the earliest days of the internet and currently has two podcasts on the Vox Media Podcast Network. The weekly show On with Kara Swisher and the twice-weekly Pivot co-hosted with Scott Galloway, who provokes as many thoughts in Kara as he induces cringes. Kara launched the All Things D conference and later website with her colleague Walt Mossberg, where they interviewed such tech luminaries as Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, and even my old boss, Alan Mulally. She and Mossberg continued that tradition when they founded the Code Conference and Recode in 2014. She's written for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and many others, and has made appearances across a range of shows too numerous to name here. But perhaps most importantly, she appeared on The Simpsons as herself. And recently, she's been named as an on-air contributor to The Chris Wallace Show on CNN. Kara is the author of AOL.com, how Steve Case beat Bill Gates, nailed the netheads, and made millions in the war for the web in 1998. Followed by There Must Be a Pony in Here Somewhere, the AOL Time Warner debacle, and the quest for a digital future in 2003. And her latest book is a memoir, Burn Book. A Tech Love Story, due out in March of 2024. Kara Swisher, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Thanks. That was so fancy. <laughs> that was a fancy beginning with the music and everything. It's the least I can do without a production staff. <laughs> your, your radio voice. Hello. It's Hello. jazz. Well, I'm I'm yeah. hoping to audition for the next Scott Free August, but then oh, it wouldn't maybe, be Scott Free. Maybe Scott. You, one can hope. One can hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. Well, the last time you and I sat down together for a formal interview, it was switched around. You were asking the questions. It was 2009 at mm -hmm. Blog World and New Media Expo. Oh, okay. Um, where you made me do my Bill Cosby impression. I don't know if you no, remember. No, don't that. do that now, please. It's, that's not a thing. To that that has not aged well. Keep but that. Keep that in the drawer. Keep that but in the you drawer. remember what he said, the, the, the quote that I, uh, I made of him, uh, that no. uh, he said cocaine. He said, I, I said, social media is like cocaine of the communications industry because cocaine intensifies your personality. Oh, and all right. The, okay. the rejoinder that Cosby had was, yes, but what if you're an a-hole? So, oh, yeah. Well, there he would know. Yeah, that that is untrue. But let, let's let's talk about what's happened in between. Um, you know, a lot has changed in the tech world, and yet a lot seems to be the same. What do you think we've gotten right since then? We? Who's we? I, I'm not part of the we. Uh, the the I, I, tech I, world, let's say. Oh, the tech world. Um, you know, it it's very convenient. The tools are amazing. I mean, you know, just like any other technology, whether it's flying or driving or electricity, it's it's ad, it's additive and, uh, and it's a net plus, I guess, if you'd have to say it that way. Um, in general, the cell phones, the ability to be mobile, the ability to work from home, all kinds of interesting things. But all of them, they're tools and then they're weapons, as uh, Brad Smith of Microsoft says. And so, you know, there there's a very famous quote I'm using in my memoir, which is. 
um, you know, when they invented the ship, they invented the shipwreck. So, you know, and then they invented the electricity, they invented the electric chair. Every single technology has its downsides and obviously misinformation, polarization. Um, I know they say they aren't polarized people, but it's, you know, people's addiction to it. Uh, teens feeling, especially girls, self-esteem declines. Um, sort of a, a way, a world that is not as unified and community oriented as it was. Um, and then people sort of going down their rabbit holes, uh, their individual rabbit holes. So. Yeah. Well, and uh, I mean, this stuff has become more apparent in, in the years since social media came onto the space. And yet, 100%. Yeah. Doesn't really seem like there's anything that's been done meaningfully uh, about it. Where, where do you think the responsibility comes from or should come from? Um, uh, at the, the tech companies, they've never been had any legislation put on them ever, which I think is unusual for one of the most powerful, well, the most powerful industry in history. Um, has no legislation attached to it um, or any kind of liability, really, for the most part. They're protected by the Section 230 in many ways. They, they don't, there's no privacy laws. There's no algorithmic transparency laws. There's no antitrust hasn't been updated. So, you know, it's, it's on our elected officials to work on those things, um, which they haven't. Um, and it's on these companies, you know, not to just say just trust us, to actually be transparent about their behaviors. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to accountability, which we're hearing a lot sure. about in the news lately. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, they're not going to do it themselves. Neither. We, listen, you work for the car industry. You know, yeah. unsafe at any speed is the thing that got people putting seatbelts in. Come on, like you know what I mean? No one's going to do it themselves. Um, and so it's really important for um, for for our our legislators and citizens to be part of the decision making here. I mean, we did pay for the internet, didn't we? So. Well, right. Uh, and I mean, do you think the, the legislators have enough working knowledge about the tech space to be oh, able to make some of these decisions? Canar. Do they have enough working knowledge about pharmacology? Do they have enough more yeah. working knowledge about <laughs> banking or cars? Or they manage to legislate everybody else. They can yeah. bring in experts and do that. It's just, it's such a ridiculous, uh, treating technologists like they're magicians of some sort is kind mm. of a ridiculous um, notion in, in my in my book. So. And and why do you think that is? Why do they get treated like magicians? Is it the money? Is it the power? Is it the well? It's what all of the above, right? It's also because it is kind of cool. It is like magic. It is like alchemy. You know what I mean? Like it's sort of. Mm. I think people who were scientists were treated like that for years, right? These amazing, you know, in medicine and scientists and doctors have been treated like that. And I think now that a lot of people have more knowledge, they're like, oh, I see what they're doing, right? And so yeah. one of the things that technologists have done is. Uh, you know, a little bit by Steve Jobs, it's all magic. It's, you know, look what I'm bringing you, a thousand phones in your pocket, a thousand songs in your pocket. Like, it feels magical. Um, and, you know, when you can communicate, I'm sure, you know, Thomas Edison was lauded as the, magi the magician of whatever, Menlo Park, right? Something like yeah. that. Yeah, Wizard of Menlo Park. Yeah. Wizard of Menlo Park, yeah. right, yeah. Wizards and magicians. Uh, well, yeah. <sighs> It, and and you, I think, in in your position, you've been able to strip a lot of that down and just get down to some of the bare bones. Yeah, yeah. What what do you, what do you attribute that ability to? Um, uh, I don't know. I just I'm not impressed by anybody. I guess you know what I mean. I'm I'm impressed, <laughs> but I'm impressed when there's real things. But I don't like I, I don't stand on ceremony. I think I would cover politicians the same way or in power. You know, um, I just tend to not be impressed. Like, I, I'm impressed by things that are impressive. Otherwise, you need mm. to show me why you deserve, you know, but I certainly am not going to, they're human beings, right? So that's one of the other parts. And I don't care how much money they have. I don't care how much, you know, power or whatever that means. Um, I just want them to tell the truth and, you know, make their case. I don't mind them making their case. That's fine. They're obviously going to be doing it in their self-interest. It's just I don't want them to lie to me and or lie to the people um, about what they're doing. And it's kind of basic. It's like, I, basically, the way I do reporting is I, I look at people and go, huh? And what? Uh, you know, that's really dumb. I know it sounds dumb, but I'm like, huh, I don't get that. Can you explain it to me? And then, oh, well, I don't like that. Like, you know, like, I, I just articulate what I think a lot of people are feeling. Yeah, and I think that level of frankness has uh, served you well. I, I want to play a quick clip here from a recent uh, speech you gave. It was a commencement address at the, the Cooper Union uh, in 2023, uh, where your attributes are clearly called out. 
Some other attributes include obnoxiousness, uh, persnickettiness, a distaste for lies, a proclivity to call out nonsense no matter the power of the person uttering it. In fact, especially if the person is powerful. That's my favorite part. This is most commonly called speaking truth to power, and I highly recommend it. So speaking truth to power, that, that seems to be difficult for a lot of people to do these days. They, they admire power. They get themselves in the good graces of power, and they're not willing to speak well, out. except they do. You know, like on Twitter, everyone has to have an opinion about everyone from Halle Berry to, you know, or Jennifer Love You, It's Face to – um, to Trump, to everything else. And I think people do talk a lot. They just talk a lot of nonsense, right? Um, mm-hmm. And they, I think people do feel, it, but it's not really power to do that. That's just slagging people. Power is really getting them to change behaviors, right? Or getting mm-hmm. legislation passed or um, moving a needle in some fashion. And so we, we, we see, it's like Soma in, I think it's Brave New World. I think that's where it is. They have Soma. Um uh, you know, people are are satisfied and distracted by things. Oh, I can talk back to, you know, whatever athlete I don't like. But you really don't, right? You're just making a lot of noise for the most part. And so I do think um, real power is making significant changes and things or seeing something wrong and fixing it uh, or creating solutions. There's a lot of pointing, but finger pointing, but not a lot of solutions these days, I think. Yeah. And and I think we're seeing too many examples of leaders uh, just being jerks in public, and and yeah. they get, well, they get forgiven. Too, right? that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Leaders, especially, have really the the the, the, the uh, they're not so special as it turns out, right? So, um, and that's you know that's really uh, that's really been one of the things that's been more problematic is you're starting to see these people in real life before they were kind of shielded and. You could right. have, including politicians, no one at the time knew, no, not, well, people close to him did, knew that LBJ was such a son of a bitch, right? Um, <laughs> but that, you know, later biographers sort of depicted that. But at the time, most of the public believed in people. And now you get to, like, can you imagine LBJ with, um, with, a, <laughs> with, with Twitter? Ay, ay, ay. Well, you know. he had a phone next to his toilet. So, you know, that's yeah, the closest right, thing. Exactly, right? Can you, get, can you get a dose of that? Like. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it just depends, you know, on where we are. Like it's just a lot of people on Twitter would have been much, it would have been a much different experience with them Yeah. at the time in real time. Later you find out what these people are actually like. So, right. Right. And you know, that, that's funny because that was one of the things I wanted to make apparent to people early on when I worked at Ford is I dealt with Alan Mulally behind the scenes all the time oh, yeah. and the, the Alan Mulally you saw on the screen and on stage and everywhere else was fantastic. And people wanted to know what he was like behind the scenes. And guess what? He was the same kind of guy. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I'd imagine he would be, actually. I, I wouldn't have. Been, that's not a surprise to me. Um, you know, a lot of the people that do really well in these days are people who are genuine. And he's a genuine. Right. He's a genuine article. Like exactly. him or don't like him. Um, and, you know, he's that's that works really rather well. And I actually am like the person I am publicly. And so yeah. that tends to work well when it becomes performative. A lot of the stuff you see Elon doing is quite performative. Um, although now it's veered into reality, unfortunately, right? It's mm-hmm. now how he thinks. So, um, you know, I'm not using him in particular, but some people are using these social media to be performative. And some people are genuine. Like, uh, oddly enough, the Kardashians, Kim, especially Kim, who I've interviewed several times, she's like the way she is on on the air. She is. She's not different. And I think that's one of the things I said to people when I had her, because they were like, how could you interview her? You've interviewed Steve Jobs, you've interviewed Bill Gates, and now Kim Kardashian. I'm like, yes, she's a very important she's successful, social media yeah. figure. And she's very important in a lot of tech, you know, in interesting ways, uh, from a celebrity point of view, right? And I was like, she's the genuine article. And everyone's like, she's not real. She's got fake this, fake that. And I'm like, I'm not talking about her butt. I'm talking about <laughs> her. She, that's what she's like. And I think it resonates yeah. with people. So. Well, and and that level of uh, being genuine and authenticity yeah. that that really yeah, seems to matter to people these days. The well, it is, but people can also manipulate authenticity. Um, you know, for a while, I do think Trump was not in person. From what I understand, having never spent time with him, he's quite funny and self deprecating. Although now he's sort of turned into the monster he created on Twitter. Right now, he's kind of when you listen to these tapes, 
Mm. What a jackass. Like, he's a jackass <laughs> full time kind of thing. You know, where I, I, let me show you the war plans. Let me, like, honestly, like, what is wrong with this person? And, and so, um, one of the things that's really, um, hard is to, um, to know what's real. And that's the whole point of it, right? That's the whole damn point of the whole thing. Yeah. And, and now, I mean, you, you segment that with what's going on with AI and you right. know the, the potential future for images right. and, and sounds and all the rest. Uh, mm -hmm. We're in for a world of hurt if these tools aren't used with the proper uh, intentions. Yes, exactly. Yes, ex exactly. Um, and so, you know, you're... Um, it's really it's really a difficult time because you don't know what's real, right? People can manipulate you in ways you didn't know, and they could do it at yeah. scale. And that's what's different. People always can manipulate. Look, communist China, Hitler, everybody, Mussolini. There's it's so easy to see how the propaganda is used, and what they've taken is those propaganda tools, which is repetition, a uh, little bit of truth within the lie, right? There's always a little mm -hmm. bit of truth within conspiracy theories. There's always a kernel of something in them, yeah. like you know, like whatever it happens to be, you know, yeah, sure. Some votes didn't work out, but it's not a widespread thing. And then they take it and make it into a bigger thing and then use the guys that just asking questions to, um, to make it even more like, yeah. it's really interesting, but it's at scale. This has occurred since the beginning in Roman times, say it's propaganda, but this is different. This is a very different kind of um, situation we find ourselves in. Yeah. And, well, and that's interesting. You mentioned uh, the Roman times. I know you recently mentioned you're reading the history of the Roman Republic. I was a I classics am. major as an undergrad, so I appreciate that. And yeah, I just, I, it's 15 minute little increments and it's by this sort of goofy, I don't even know who he is. He's a professor, but um, it's really interesting. You see real, um, you know, you see real, there's nothing new under the sun as I think exactly. he said that sophically, one of, not sophocles who said that. Ugh, I'll look it up. Uh, anyway, go, I'll look <laughs> it up. I think it was Voltaire. It. No, it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. It was someone older, someone in a toga. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, well, that's the thing that even these quotes repeat themselves over time. It's a phrase from the book of uh, it's the Bible, but someone else one four. Yeah, that's that's right. Please, he asked it. But but the point there, I guess, is that human nature is constant, and you see what happened in the first century BC. Uh, yeah. You know, a century ago, here, a decade mm -hmm. ago, we're repeating the same mistakes, and you'd yeah. think we would learn from them. So, you know, back yeah. to our original conversation. Uh, tech made this huge uh, misjudgment on social media and its impact on society. Have we learned enough to be able to avoid some of those with AI? Um, no, no. <laughs> we'll make the same mistakes over <laughs> and over again. No. I mean, I think people are more aware of AI, and I think a lot of the creators have been much more responsible in sounding the alarms. Now, maybe that's because they want to get ahead of the lawsuits, or I don't know, whatever. Um, but it's really, th there's been a lot more talking about the, when the beginning of the internet, everything was up and to the right and it was unicorns and, you know, watermelon, everything, everything was great, right? It was never, it was all enjoyable and lovely. And so I think that the, the new people doing AI and a lot of them are the same people have learned. And so they're not going to tell you they didn't warn you. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. that's, that is different from what happened before. You never heard a, 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 a crossword out of anybody um, whatsoever. Well, and, and that really kind of comes down to, I mean, it couples with what we were talking about before in terms of being jerks. Mm -hmm. I mean, but there, there seems to be this, this notion that if you create controversy, that somehow creating mm -hmm. heat is equivalent to creating light. And yes, that's correct. And, and people seem to thrive on controversy, whether it's drama in uh, the public sphere, the political sphere, the tech sphere, um, how do we start to draw the line and start getting people well, you know, to focus is, on the good is, stuff? This is human nature. This is not a new yeah. thing. There's been just like, actually a new study out that it motivates, conflict motivates people. It's, it's part of our nature. And I know everyone like, oh, we can be better. I'm like, oh, we could, but we're, we're not that far from where we came. Right. And so conflict is part is, is in our DNA. I do think so is hope. So is um, love and everything else. But conflict is a very big motivator for people, mo fear, conflict. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't know if you can get it out of people. I think it's very, it's like being attracted to, you know, when you're in a, a, a casino, it's a track, it pulls you in, there's something <laughs> that pulls you into it. And so it's got the thing about a lot of digital d technologies, not every one of them, you know, you call an Uber, you, 
just call it. You don't spend a lot of time hanging out on the Uber app, right? It doesn't it doesn't have any kind of compelling quality yeah. to it, but a whole lot of it does, uh, whether it's news or what's next, what are people saying? You know, there's always been a over the fence gossip. This is gossip on a big scale. Um, people are attracted to entertainment. Some of it feels like entertainment. Um, so, you know, it's not, I don't find that weird in any way. Um, I just think it's really, it, 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 it's again, it, it, on a scale. That's my issue with right. it. The scale becomes crazy. It, the scale is crazy, really, if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, everything you've been mentioning, it's this, this dichotomy of life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you mentioned yeah. this in your speech, the uh, entropy and syntropy. Right. Yeah. I have, that's my tattoos. Those are my tattoos. Yeah, and, and entropy tends toward death. Syntropy tends toward life. And yet. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they're, they're inter, you can't have one without the other. That's right. That's right. And you know, every, I mean, it's Newton's law, right? I mean, but we, we seem to focus more on the negative or give more attention to the negative. To chaos. To yeah. chaos and destruction. Yeah. And to well, me, there's there's so many good things that are happening in the world. So many people that are trying their best, that have some wonderful virtues. They don't tend to get the headlines, though. Um, that's true. They don't. And so one of the things that is um, – you know, it's just like, you don't write the plane didn't crash on the way to blank, right? You just, it's like sort of normal in that regard, right? So people are attracted by accidents or rubbernecking or whatever it happens to be. And the, again, the internet is designed for that because it's so, it's so constant and there's constant, like that bull that is riding around in Texas, I guess. I don't know. Someone had a bull in the back <laughs> of their car. I like, saw you can't not look away. You can't, you're like, what the f and before that, we'd get in a newspaper and you'd see it and then people would talk about it. But now you can share it. You can look at it. There can be memes on it. There can be songs. And so it becomes something, you know, in that way, that's a positive thing. Cause what a crazy piece thing that is, right? But, you know, you can easily take that in a negative direction quite easily, actually. Yeah. And I mean, that's really human nature of uh, wanting to have shared experiences. We have so few right. opportunities to do that anymore. You know, there used to right. be, 100%. what, three channels. Everybody watched Johnny Carson yeah, at night. I mean, that was, yeah, and now, exactly. you know, yeah. your life is the internet. So yeah, it is. And so it, it's really hard to, to imagine anything else, right? Like, yeah. and so you get used to it. And I do think the human brain does get, um, get used to it. They, they, um, they do. They just get used to it completely. Yeah. And that that's what it really does. It starts, you know, we develop over time of what we are interested in, the ability to read and not read uh, quickly. Um, you know, that that's something, you know, people don't, don't have patience for that anymore. Yeah. For example. Speaking of uh, reading, it's been, what, two decades since your last book came out? Yes. I keep I keep turning down book contracts is what I do. So why now? Um, I, I, cause the editor, um, the, the editor bugged me so much, um, that I did it, I guess. I don't know what else to say. I don't have any excuse. I just, the editor is John Carp. He was my editor when I was, um, when I was doing, um, uh, when I did my first book on AOL, he was okay. just an editor. Now he's running Simon and Schuster and he just called me a lot, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of money. <laughs> they gave me a lot of money. Like, you know, I just, I figured whatever Walt was writing his memoir, Walt Mossberg, mm. who was my partner for a long time. And then he, he decided, uh, against it. He decided against it and didn't, which I thought was really compelling. You know, mm. I thought that was kind of cool too. So this is a, this is a memoir, right? I mean, this is it's a uh, memoir. Yeah. Your mm -hmm. interactions with tech leadership. What, yeah. give us a thumbnail. Oh, it's a, it's funny. It's, it's mean. It's funny. It's, um, it's, a it's about, um, it, it's about, it's about what I think of these people and what happened to them. It's, <clears throat> it's a, it's a, it's a love story uh, it's, and a falling out of love story, really. If I, that's why I call it a tech love story. Um, it's someone who I love tech and I fell in love with tech right away when I first started really covering the internet, especially particularly the internet, obviously that was my tech. I'm sure I would have fallen in love with airplanes if I was back in the Wright brothers days. Um, but, uh, but I did, I was like fell hard and I thought it had great promise and it does and it has. And the course of, in the course of the book, it 
the scales fall away from my eyes, let's just say. You know what I mean? And I'm angry. I'm disappointed. I'm sad. Um, I hope for better. I keep hoping for a better turn turnout than what's happened. So that that's that's what um, that's what it's about. Has has your opinion changed as you wrote the book, or has it changed over the course of your career? No, it's I'm where I am. You know, I think the stuff at Twitter has sort of been perfect for my book in a weird way, mm. but I'm sad that it is perfect. Yeah, I, it is. It is sad what's happened there. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, Kara's going to tell us about some of the leaders who are on her good list. Stay with us. You're here because you're interested in personal development and professional development, I would say, as well. And many people, as they seek to develop themselves professionally, seek out MBAs. Well, MBA programs can be expensive. And as you know, the financial investment can take years to recoup. And it means taking time away from your job that results in a loss of income and stalls your career progression in the shorter term. Well, there's an answer to that now with Augment. Augment is an online alternative MBA that's taught by founders of Wikipedia, Shazam, Waze, YouTube, and more. There's hundreds of students who are already using the lessons of this program to take the next step in their careers. It's 100% self-paced. You get a certification signed by the founder of Shazam when you've completed it. And the curriculum along the way is what you would find in some of the best business schools, business and strategy, marketing, innovation, entrepreneurship, leadership, management, and more. As you know, I'm a big proponent of lifelong learning and when you learn from people who have been there and done that, you're getting information that is relevant and information you can trust. I'd like you to check them out at augment.org where you can get your alternative MBA for 50% off the regular program fees. All you have to do is go to augment.org and use the code Monty Scholarship, all one word, Monty Scholarship at augment.org. Isn't it time for you to take the next step in your career without breaking the bank? So, I mean, we, we certainly get a lot of your <laughs> opinions on people like Elon, and we know what Elon's opinion of you is, unfortunately. Um, but talk about some leaders that you admire and why. Um, there's a lot. I like, there's a lot. I like, um, I have a lot of regard for Tim Cook and, uh, I, I liked Steve Jobs quite a bit, actually. I thought he had a lot of, in, you know, issues, of course, but he, there was also a lot to recommend him if you actually go back and listen to a lot of what he said. He's, he's very, um, calm compared to everybody else now. I mean, he, he was like the big maverick. He's like sensible, actually, when you listen to a lot of his quotes in his interviews with me and Walt. Um, I really like um, Reed Hoffman. I really like he's a venture capitalist. I really like Reed Hastings. I think he's a really interesting entrepreneur. Um, I really like um, oh Lisa Sue, who runs the AMD. Um, I really like um, I like Andy Jassy personally. Um, you know, Amazon's a lot. There's a lot going on there. Um, I, I, I very much enjoy um, talking to people like Bob Iger. I just did an interview with Barry Diller. Um, cause I cover media too, um, who I like, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people doing interesting and innovative things. Um, Brian, younger people, Brian Chesky, uh, at Airbnb. I have a lot of regard for uh, Sam Altman, who's running open AI. I really do think he's very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't agree with them on everything they're doing, but I, I, I at least respect him and feel like he's not, he's not a, a, a malevolent personality kind of thing as many of them have become or, or are. Like, like, like Bond villains come to life. Yeah, it's true. Like a lot of them could really <laughs> should have done better. And even the, the sort of um, the ones that are okay people like Mark Zuckerberg, you're like, you can't deny some of the damage he's done, right? right. Like I, he, personally, he's a very lovely person, actually. And people, when I say that, people are like, how could you say that? I'm like, well, he is. He's not 
a jerk. He's very, you know, he's a good parent that I could see, you know. Um, I mean, I'm not inside his house, but, uh, you know, like, but the stuff he's doing, yeah, the choices he's made, oh, wow. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that, you know, is Sheryl Sandberg similar? I very much like Sheryl personally. Um, but, you know, she's made some compromises over the course of her career. For what? For what? I'm not sure. No. Money, I guess. I don't know. I don't even think she likes money that much. So. And that, that raises an interesting point, kind of ties back to uh, what we were talking about before with accountability. You know, we've seen people that have uh, risen high and fallen hard, people like Adam mm-hmm. Newman from WeWork, um, and yet they're rewarded for that, while people like uh, Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos get sent to prison. Yeah, uh, is there well. is there a double standard for men and women in tech? It certainly, as Martha Stewart sort of said that uh, she's like, "Am exactly. I the only one?" And by the way, I what didn't go. I, I she was like, "I didn't go to jail for talk, insider talk trading. Get to jail for lying to the FBI." I was like, "Thank you, Martha, <laughs> for clarifying." Um, but um, she's correct. Um, I do. I was like, "Wow, her over everyone." I see why a prosecutor would do it because she's famous and it's a great case and it calls attention, etc. Um, yeah, I do. I think. Look, what Elizabeth Holmes did was wrong, right? It just was, and it was illegal what she yeah. was doing. Um, but you know, she got convicted not about consumers but about investors. She screwed investors, really. How many of the like I could I on my hand I could name twenty five people who screwed investors and knew they were doing it, and you know. It, they got they, lots of reasons they got away with it. You know, they maybe they didn't cross that line, but it was still unethical and terrible. Um, so it's, um, you know, it just depends on, on, on who you are and where you are. But I do think that, you know, she's interesting though. I see why the turtlenecks, the weird voice, the, you know, the blood, she sort of put herself out there. She actually came to me several times wanting to get on code stage or whatever event I was doing at the time. And, um, uh, uh, it was, you know, I was like, I don't know what you're doing lady. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was uh, the great, great job of smoke and mirrors for so long, but yeah, yes, yes, that's right. No, she's not the only person, you know, who was doing that. Yeah. Um, Well, that was, that was one case where the magic just got you know, ripped away and suddenly you saw inside the box how the lady was sawed in half. And hey, guess right, what? Exactly. We were all being tricked. But, you know, I mean, I don't, I feel like, you know, okay, they got her. Great. So, yeah. I, okay, <laughs> good for them. But I don't know if it was like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, it just was a lot of time spent. Uh, you know, although I still think she's a liar, like no question. There's, I don't have any question. They, I think they proved that one pretty clearly. So. Yeah, I know. It's tough. Um, yeah. Let's let, let's talk a little bit more about you. Uh, you seem to have boundless energy. I don't know where you get I it do. from. I don't either. I don't know. I don't know. Well, part of me kind of looks at you, looks at your drive. I know your your mm-hmm. personal story. Your dad died when yeah. you were very young. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Is it is it almost like a Hamiltonian like thing where you're just trying to churn <sighs> yeah, out as much as you can? Interesting. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm not going to miss my shot. Um, uh, it's interesting. He was like, he was quite peripatetic like that, wasn't he? He sort of had to go. Maybe he knew he had limited time. I don't know with him, obviously. I did see the, I did see the musical though. Um, <laughs> but it was quite good. I'd give it a, I'd give it a, I'd give it the th- five stars. Um, uh, it was, um, you know, I don't know. I just like what I said. We were talking about this last night. A, a friend of mine is leaving the Washington Post, um, uh, the guy who's the managing editor and, He's going off to England. He's going to become a poet, right? Which was fascinating. Wow. Yeah. God, can you imagine going from running the Washington Post to that? You know, and he's moving to England. His wife is an older friend of mine, and uh, sh- uh, they're both doing that. They're changing their lives completely. And um, and I was, we were having a discussion about this and what they would do with their lives. So he was going to do poetry and the high, whatever the highlands, the lowlands, whatever you call them in in uh, England, in the very beautiful parts. Um and she didn't know what she was going to do. She's been a very successful executive at a bunch of companies. And, um, you know, she's talking about teacher's age. She's talking about pottery. She's talking about all kinds of different things she could do as for her next job. And I thought, I would never fucking do that. I said it out loud. And they're like, would you? I was like, no. And my wife was like, she's going to die working. And And my friend said, which I think was very correct, was, you know, one, you get to pick what you do all the time. She felt like she was on a hamster wheel. And 
I don't. I don't. I love what yeah. I do. And so yeah. that's what it is. Like, and I was so like, not like, I don't feel sorry for me that I'm like such a workaholic, but I'm not. I love it. It's really good. It's interesting. I do stop doing things and leave places that I, once I find them not interesting, right? Yeah. So that's really the issue that I have is that I, I, I will leave places rather easily if I, if I don't like what I'm doing. And so I think about whether I'm happy at what I'm doing. Like I'm enjoying myself in a lot of ways. I don't think enough people do that. You know, I think people just get locked no. into what they're doing, what's comfortable. They're afraid right. to make a change. What, a, a number of reasons, right? But mm -hmm. yeah. you've been in a position where you've been able to kind of write your own ticket at every turn. I have, but it's not because it's not because I'm well. Maybe I'm smarter than other people, but you know, mm -hmm. some people. Um, I I just just I think if you like I said I think I said this in a Vanity Fair thing. If getting out of line, people are always wanting you to stay in line. They want you to be on the hamster wheel. I don't like it there. So and I don't like working in a like I was doing remote work for twenty years. Like I was like I don't want to go in the office and look at you. Like yeah. and because my work was good. I was able to say that to people, right? I think you can't do that if your work isn't good. Um, right, And right. I, I think if you don't, you're like, no, you can actually leave, right? You can actually leave for good. Um, and I, but I don't mind that. If they said that, I'd be fine too. Like, I'm like, okay, all right, I'll find something else. Like, I, I think people should decide what, what they want in their workers. And then if the workers don't want to do it, they can leave. And if the workers can't go, you know, well, I don't want to. And the, the company can decide, you know, this whole remote thing. I'm like, let the companies decide. Don't work for that company if they want to do that. Like, right. you have the choice to do that yourself. And so I, that's how I've operated. I'm like, I don't like this place. I'm going to go. And I don't, I'm not mad at the company. I, like, a lot of people get disgruntled at their workplace. I'm like, well, that's the way they are. I'm not that way. Like, I, I have no harm, no foul attitude toward most people I work with. Like, yeah. you know, but, yeah. you know, and, and even the one where, I write about a lot in the book where I worked for John McLaughlin, who sexually harassed uh, a woman at work that I testified against him. Um, I, I, I told him he was terrible. I testified against him and I left. Right. That's okay. And that was that. That was that. And I was like, what? I, like, I, I did my best and I did my job. And I also didn't allow um, him to, you know, I just was like, I'm getting out of here because uh, you suck, right? Oh! So that's what I did. And 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 I and it was a good move. Like, but at the time I was in my 20s, it was a good job. You know, he, he had a hit show. Um, and so it was a choice, I mean. And he was great fodder for SNL. He was. I was. Uh, he was such a terrible person. But, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I was educated and smart and a white lady in America. So I had more advantages and other i get that people can't always leave you know i get that completely have you ever been scared in a workplace situation no no not really i can't imagine you were but no. I, just... no. I had one guy i wrote about he said i got him fired show up my house once um and i was weird he was you know he was known for hitting women so um that was a little bit like, but I was like, you give it a try, dude. Like, let's just remember, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I hit back kind of thing. I yeah. have that. That's the attitude I have. But he was, that was definitely, I have kids. So I was like, what are you doing in my house? Like, why are you at my home? Crazy. Man. Yeah. Well, that's the only time. It was, it was, irrit it was more irritating than scary and weird. Yeah. Just weird. Just fucking weird. You weird. That is weird. So, um, yeah. um so the couple minutes a day that you're not working, uh, what, <laughs> what, what do you do to uh, to unwind? What do you do for fun? Oh, have raise my kids. <laughs> yeah. Nothing, nothing. Um, no, I really have um, nothing. I mean, I watch TV. I like hobbies, streaming. Anything? I don't have any hobbies. I did. I used to play tennis. I used to rollerblade. I, I work out. I like to work out. Yeah. I make sure I have time in my day to do that because I think physical. Um, I take walks and stuff like that. I walk a lot of places. Um, I, you know, I grow tomatoes, stuff like that. But I do that with the kids. I try to do a lot yeah. of stuff with my kids. I'm very into, we're renovating my house. I love home renovation. And so that's a hobby for me. That's great. Yeah, I love it. I did a beautiful job at my house in San Francisco, and now I'm doing one in Washington. And I, I, I love that. That's my 
I, I like hardware stores. I go to hardware stores and look at things, you know. Um, but mostly I spend time with my kids. I have four kids yeah. and I just got two of them off, one to college for the first time in Michigan. The other uh, went to Argentina for his junior year abroad. Um, and I have two small children. And so they're about to start school. So I do, uh, there's a lot of, lot of kid stuff. I spend a lot of my time dealing with my kids in some way. And it's totally enjoyable. There's, like I spent a week in San Francisco with my second kid before we went to college. We had, a, we had a ball and I went to New York with my other oldest kid. And we just had a ball and we went and got like massages at, at the Chinese in Chinatown. We went and ate. We went to the Peking Duck place that we like. We, um, I don't know, we did all kinds of stuff. That's yeah. awesome. So, That's yeah. a, so you, you've, you've raised two very successful uh, sons. So far. Yeah. So far. Um, anything crossed. you think you do differently with the younger two? Uh, I'm a little. I I would say I I work a lot, so um, I can work at home a lot more, so I can move my time around. I I did that. I mm-hmm. actually did that with the little kids too. I used to take them to dinner every night or make dinner. Uh, my ex wife worked at Google, so she had to drive. So I had um, I had them at dinner most many nights, um, and uh, I uh, I. I, I guess I guess I'm a little more present. I would guess I have I don't know. I had a very um, I was pregnant with Louis, so I was a little more tired after him. So yeah. um, uh. it was a little easier because my wife had both kids. Um, I don't know. I'm a little I'm a little more present. I'm not. I'm I'm calmer. I guess I'm not worried about. I'm much more like yeah, whatever. Like I don't really like. I don't like agonize over like. Um, I didn't at the time either, I guess, you know, like potty training, um, you know, my, uh, I think, you know, everybody's like, Oh, how am I going to get my kid to potty train? Even at the time I was like, everyone, you know, poops like, and even the (laughs) stupid people. So I don't know how (laughs) your kids will poop just fine. I think I said that at the time. And I said it this time too, like everybody poops, everyone can do it eventually. Very few people can't. Um, so I guess, no, I guess I'm the same parent. I'm, I'm the fun parent. My my son got me a hat, Michigan dad. I'm like the fun dad, I guess. <laughs> I don't want. I don't. I hate to do that with lesbians, but it's 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 a fair assessment of me. You That's know? awesome. So I would say I, I am a Michigan dad. Yeah. Well, you're you're a fun dad. You're a fun guest. So uh, uh-huh. I want to leave on one thing. Um, okay. You were a literature and journalism major as an undergrad. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, history, I've, actually, history. history. I, okay, it's called comparative and regional. I went to the Foreign Service School at Georgetown. Okay, yeah. So uh, clearly, there's a love for humanities in you, and that comes through mm-hmm. in your yes, writing for and sure. your work. I wasn't a science major or math major like my son <laughs> is at Michigan. As as so many communications people find out, you know, I, mm-hmm. I would have been a doctor if it wasn't for the science thing. You know, I'll tell you, I'm not bad. At, I'm very good at business, though. That's which I think yeah. is different. But I've heard you uh, recently profess your love of poetry for all things. Oh, yeah. I Talk love a little bit about maybe favorite poems, oh, favorite poets, um, where you're inspired. Oh, lots of them. I like, I love all poets. Um, I was speaking with my friend who's becoming a poet. Um, I love poetry. I've been reading it for, I find it very, that is a hobby, actually. I read poetry. Um, I find, you know, beautifully rendered in a very, usually a very short time. Um, you know, I like all poets. I like, you know, I'll read sonnets of Shakespeare. I'll read, you know, Maggie Smith. I did a good interview with her. Um, while Stevens is a favorite of mine, um, um, Louise Gluck is probably my favorite poet, I would say. Or Gluck, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, I just love poetry. She's She would be my top poet. Carolyn Forche is another favorite of mine. Um, I just have always thought it was just, I just, there. it's I just, it moves me in a lot of ways. And, you know, I love entertainment. I love movies and TV and stuff like that. But I really love reading poetry. I really do. Yeah. Um, I don't understand it all the time, but it's like art. I, 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 the other day I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take an art course. I'm going to do, I'm doing a seminar at AU uh, for them on my book and stuff. And I'm going to, they're letting me take a course about it. I'm going to take an art history course because I love looking at art, but I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at. And so it's sort of like, I would like someone to teach me. And that, that's how I feel about poetry. I, um, uh, my, my wife was a, got an MFA in poetry too, by the way. Um, so I, I don't, I'm, I'm like, don't know a lot, but I know what I like. If that makes sense. I'm not no expert, but I know no. what I like to read and it's a little shorter. It just is a, evocative, emotional, I don't know. I just like it. Everybody should read poetry. 
other than I, I'm right there with you. Um, yeah. I, I love poetry too. Mm-hmm. And, um, even if it's just a stanza or two that I pull, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for some kind of inspiring quote or yes. it has to do with something. That's well, if you can find something and apply it to your life in a way that's meaningful yeah. to you, then we all win. Right. I, I like I like speeches, too. I like all yes. kinds of things. I like I, I like, um, you know, it's interesting. One of my favorite pieces that people are like, what's one of your favorite pieces of writing? I said the Gettysburg fucking address. Yes. Like I was like, not just I, I like it's like 400 words. It's like astonishing. And I sit there. Ken Burns and I talked about this. He did a whole uh, thing on kids learning the memorizing the Gettysburg Address, and um, these kids who were had learning. I think they had learning disabilities or something like that. Anyway, um, just what an ins- just take a friggin' look at that thing. It is yeah. the most perfect piece of writing, and you just everything is in there. There's moving. It's moving. It's short. It's sweet. It's it's quite astonishing as a piece of writing. Um, and I just, that's the kind of stuff I like to look at. I, I just, I, I read it over and over again. I'm like, how did he do this? Like, it's really, try to take it apart, right? Like, yeah. wow, this just, it's perfect. It's absolutely fucking perfect. So that's the kind of things I, I like to look at, how people love manage that. to communicate in a really beautiful way. Same thing with movies. Or I'm not as big a music person. I just, again, I don't have the language of it as other, my sons do, certainly. Well, I, would you call yourself a Swifty? Yes, yes, of course. But that's different. She's like the best person on earth. She's like, she literally should be president of the United States. That is just <laughs> all I have to say. Like, sh- that concert was the most enjoyable. I haven't gone to a concert in years. Um, and I have to say, what an amazing, what an amazing experience. From the parking to the food, to the seats, to every single bit. Of, and she worked her ass off and she certainly didn't have to. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, and that's excellence. Like, that's what I really appreciate. And that's what I go for every, that's, if you had to say one thing, I care about excellence in the end. Like, don't do it. Just don't do it if you're going to do a shitty job of it. So. A hundred percent. hundred percent. So uh, what are you going to be excellent at next, Kara Swisher? Well, I'm, I'm very interested in video and television right now. If everyone's running from it and I'm like, no, I'm, how could it be good? Like it's to change my life, right? So um, I just am really interested in video right now. I'm, I am, and I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm. Th- I think about it a lot. Like, how could you make this better? That kind of thing. So that's great. Well, hey, thanks for joining us here on Timeless Leadership. Oh, no problem. Anytime, Scott. You're also a very good tweeter, by the way. But get you're a good threader. Are you threading? You're threading too, right? I am threading now. Yeah, yeah thread's fun. Thread, it's fun. Threads is just, it's cleaner. It's easier to use. I just, it is. It's very pleasant. I, I can it's see, kind of, I can see where the path it's going. it's going. Yeah. You can see where it's going, can't you? Yeah. Uh huh. Exactly. That's what it's I agree with. Nothing but you. success. Yeah. We'll see. He's good at social media, whatever his different, different sundry problems. He's certainly good at. And this one is actually the good part of yeah. fa- what Facebook does. I have to say, I was like, okay, now you're making something interesting, like, or you're making something good. Um, and I know people are slagging it, but I don't agree with them. Look, I just like the service. Not everything there is um, Mark Zuckerberg, but it's it's uh, it's it's well done. I'm just hey, listen. I'm such a critic of him. I think I someone told me uh, that he sent a text. Can you believe Kara's on this? Like, <laughs> yes, I can. It's good, Mark. I will. If you do something good, and if you want to keep doing shitty things, I'll get off of your crap. You know, what right? I mean? I mean, you do give him credit. Yeah. Why not? Anyway, anyway, Scott, thank you so much. Good luck. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with the fascinating Kara Swisher. I'll be back again next week with a commentary show. In the meantime, there are links that you should check out related to the show, including a link to pre-order Kara's book. Check it out on TimelessTimely.com or on the show notes right here. If you have any feedback or questions, please let me know at TimelessPod at ScottMonte.com. Write in with any questions for next week's show. Meanwhile, in the week ahead, I hope the actions that you take inspire other people to learn more, dream more, do more, and become more. That's the true hallmark of a timeless leader. Our music here is Americana Aspiring by Kevin McLeod. Don't forget to leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Until next time, I'm Scott Monty. Thanks, and I'll see you on the Internet.